So, uh, you know, we're, we're going through challenging times right now as a church uh, because um, God loves Roehampton so much, right? He, he loves Roehampton so much that he came down, died on the cross to give peace and eternal life to everyone who believe in him, right? And there's 13,000 people who live here in Roehampton, yet some numbers say 20,000. I like to be, go on a conservative side of things, not politically, but like, you know, let's say 13,000, because if I say 20,000 and someone thinks I'm talking it up, I, I don't want to do that. So let's say it's 13,000 people in Roehampton by some statistics, right? And our church is tiny. Our church is absolutely tiny, right? And the other churches in Roehampton are small as well. And it's like, how do we spread the message to people in Roehampton that Jesus loves them so much that he would die on the cross for them? Like, logistically, it's a nightmare. You know, just like if today we were like, we've got people getting food ready to eat later. Imagine if we were like, that food needs to stretch to 13,000 people in Roehampton. Logistically, it's, an, it's a nightmare, yeah? Um, and so for our small church, it's like, how can, how can we do this? And we're trying to work out, what do we do? Do we carry on as a church? Or is it time to call it a day? We, we get one bit of bad news after another over the last few months, which makes us think, is it time to close the doors? Like, does God want us to close the doors? Or is it the case that, no, we need to put some things in place so that we can reach Roehampton um, better? Could someone just shut that? Door, please. Thanks. Um, and so there's another problem, though, which is that in Roehampton, 13,000 people, a lot of people in Roehampton don't know that God is for them and don't know that Christians are for them. So increasingly, Christians are getting known as people who are against people. You might have heard the phrase culture wars or culture warriors. And a lot of people right now, particularly young people, are viewing Christians as people who are against them, who are saying, we're having our way of life changed by society. Society's bad. Society's going to hell. We've got to fight back, get our way of life back. And, and it's such a different stance to the stance of Jesus saying, I've, I've hung on the cross for you so that you can experience peace. We've got these two problems in Roehampton, right? One, logistically, how do we carry on and reach Roehampton? And two, what do we do about the fact that so many people in Roehampton don't know that Jesus is for them and that Christians are for them? And so we've been working our way through Luke's gospel over the last year and, or is it a year? I, I don't, well, however long it's been, we've got to chapter 10 in Luke's gospel, and we're at verse four today. Um, and we just remind ourselves what we looked at over the last few weeks. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse one, it says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, we've already done a sermon on this, so I'm not gonna re rehash that, right? But I just wanna point out something here that, Jesus was specifically giving them instructions so that they could go to the towns that he was going to go to before he died on the cross. So he's got a time limit. Jesus knows he's going to go to the cross. When he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be hung on the cross. He knows that. So he gives them specific instructions because there's a time crunch. And I say that because we've got to be careful how we apply these next bits because we are not the 72 disciples back then going from town to town. So we've got to be careful, a bit like, you know, there's a Bible verse where Paul says, bring me my cloak. And when we read that, we don't say, hey guys, let's all grab a cloak and travel to the Mediterranean and plant the cloak where Paul wrote this letter. We, we don't, because we're like, that was for a specific thing. But at the same time, we also don't want to just be like, ah, that was just for back then with the 72. It's got nothing for us today. We want to look at what are the principles here that will give us wisdom today, especially because we're under a time crunch too. So last week I shared an estimated time frame of how much time I thought our church might have left. 
I think we do need to come up with a date where we say, if we haven't got certain changes in place by this date, then we close as a church. Because otherwise, I'm worried we'll burn people out. And people at New Life Church are such servant, good, servant-hearted people that I know that if we don't have a cutoff, people will just work as hard and hard as they can until you know, they're crawling on the ground you know, and still serving people cups of tea from the floor. You know. And, and I, I don't want to burn people out. I don't think serving Jesus is supposed to be like burn, burning out like that. Um, and so I think we need to come up with a realistic cutoff date of at what point does ministry stop being safe for the people we're ministering to and the people who are doing the serving as well? We, it needs to be safe. So, um, verse, uh, and those of you who are new, you're wondering, why are there these black and white symbols coloring in? So we have coloring in sheets, for, if anyone wants to color in as we go through the service. And the clock is to do with the point that we're on a time crunch, just like Jesus is and his disciples were. Okay, so verse two, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And you might remember, hi mate, you might remember that I asked when we preached on this verse a few weeks ago, please, when we brush our teeth, can we all say this prayer for Roehampton? Every time we brush our teeth, can we pray, Lord, send workers into the harvest field? And maybe every time we say grace before dinner, pray that God would send workers to Roehampton. We need workers. Okay, so then verse three, he said, go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. And we looked at this last week about about that verse, about wolves. And now we get to verse four. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. So the first bit, he's saying to his disciples, don't take money with you. He's saying, do not take a purse. He's telling them, don't take money. Why is he telling them to not take money? I think it's hard to get this until in a few verses time, Jesus says something similar. And I think it gets easier to understand why he's saying this. But I also think the next phrase helps us understand it. The next bit says, and do not greet anyone on the road. Now, let's just, what do you guys think? Does this sound like fr- a friendly way for them to go to all the towns and tell people the good news of Jesus? What do you think, guys? No. It doesn't, to us, it doesn't sound very friendly, does it? It's like, what do you mean, don't, don't greet anyone? And I don't think Jesus literally means like, you know, someone says hello and you're like, you know, I don't, I don't think that's what it means, but I think he's trying to get something across about a sense of urgency. Remember, they've got limited time. And in this ancient culture, greetings took a long time, right? So in Roehampton, you can walk down the street, see someone, you know, go, all right. And they can say, all right. And that can be job done. You've greeted them. You know, it's perfectly polite to do that. But in some cultures, that would be really rude. So years ago, I was a missionary in Albania. And in Albania, when you greet someone, you say, hi, how are you? How is your house? How's your family? How's your mum? And they ask you the same questions. And there was a time years ago where there was an emergency And I was in a rush. I had to find this guy. I can't remember his name. Let's call him Stephen. Had to find this guy. Stephen, and I rush into a shop where I know the people in the shop, and I rush in, and I, and I say to them, I say, do you know where? And I suddenly realized, oh, this is so rude. And I was like, uh, how are you? And they tell me how they are. I'm like, how's your house? How, how's your family? How's your mom? And they ask me all the same questions. And then I went, have you seen Stephen? <laughs> you know, and then rushed on with my emergency. And so I think what Jesus is getting at here is, listen, you don't have a lot of time to go to all these towns before I go to them and then go to the cross. So you've got to be quick. There isn't time for long greetings. Don't get sidetracked from the mission. I think that's the heart of what Jesus is saying here, right? So what that means is that right now for us in Roehampton, we, we're under a time pressure as a church. We haven't got that many Sundays left in us as things are. And so we need a sense of urgency, not panic, not panic, but a sense of urgency. They're different things, right? We don't need to panic. We trust Jesus. But we need a sense of urgency, a bit like wok cooking. 
So does anyone like cooking with a wok here? Anyone? Okay, so wok cooking is very fun, but it's very fast. So there's other meals you cook where, as you're cooking, you can walk in the other room every now and then and do something or answer the phone, you know. But with wok cooking, it's not like that. You have everything laid out, all your ingredients, before you even heat the wok. You get the wok very hot, and then you chuck in some ingredients and you listen for the sizzle. And if it's not sizzling, you need more heat. If it's sizzling too much, you're going to burn your food. You need to turn down the heat. So you have to be there the whole time, listening to the wok, and with a sense of urgency. Oh, I don't want to burn this, but I've got to get the timing right for putting the next ingredients in, and I don't want to put too many ingredients in at once because then there won't be the sizzle. So it's very pastoral, in a sense, that you're really looking out for the wok and the food in the wok, and at the same time, there's a sense of urgency. Right, and similarly with our church right now, we need to take the same approach of what cooking, in that we need to be listening out. Like every Sunday when we're here, we need to be listening out. What are people's needs? How much sizzle is going on? If there's no sizzle, if it's kind of like we're dead, then something's wrong. But if there's too much sizzle, and we've got too much drama, then we need to be. Making adjustments for that as well.、And、we always need to be listening, and to not step away from the wok. So, for example,、um, I do deep fat frying in my wok. I do not have a deep fat fryer. I do southern fried chicken in my wok. And when you heat this much, this depth of oil in a wok, the rule is never walk away. You never walk away from a wok that is on heat that has lots of oil in, because that will turn to fire, just like that, and you have a big fire in your kitchen. So you never walk away from it. And the same way, our church is in a season where right now we can't walk away from it. We can't. We can't walk away from it because it's unsafe to do that. In Rockhampton, we have lots of vulnerable people. In New Life Church, over the years, we have lots of vulnerable people come through our doors, and if we walk away from church, we leave vulnerable people hurting. Now, I just want to be clear: this isn't a guilt trip. This is not a guilt trip. So, I'm saying something, but I'm not saying something. So, I just want to be clear: I'm saying that for New Life to carry on, we need a core group of people who are committed to be here every Sunday, to always be here. Sometimes you won't be able to be here. But you communicate with someone. Sorry, I can't be there. But we really do need a core group that are here consistently every Sunday. It's not safe to do ministry in Rockhampton without a core group. People will get hurt. People will have too much sizzle going on in their life, too much heat. And if there's not enough safe people around who can listen to that and be like,、oh, "We need to help this person," that's that's not safe. But I'm not putting a guilt trip on anyone at church. Who struggles to come every Sunday? We're not that kind of church. It's inevitable that in church life there will always be people that struggle with coming every Sunday. We're not putting a guilt trip out there for anyone like that. We're just saying to carry on. We need a core group who who would say, "I can make every Sunday." Once in a while, I won't be able to make a Sunday, but when that happens, I'll clearly communicate ahead of time so everyone else can make sure there's enough safe people around. Okay, so. Then in verse five, Jesus says, "When you enter a house, first say, what word does it say? Peace, peace, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. So notice, the first thing they say is peace, and saying peace to this house. And isn't this interesting?" He doesn't say the first thing you've got to do is find out is this person a Christian. He doesn't say first thing you've got to find out is do they have the same political views as you. He doesn't say anything like that. All he says is say peace to them. So it's like we're supposed to have this stance of peace, like just throwing our peace to people and saying peace to you, peace to this house, peace to this home. Jesus wants you to have peace. That's the stance we're supposed to have. And the sad thing is, a lot of people in Rockhampton think that Christians' first stance towards them is as a soldier, who's straight away saying, "Oh, I don't agree with you, 
because you're this, that, that, that. And all the culture war stuff that comes with this. You're following an ideology. I don't agree with that. All, all this kind of stuff that Christians more and more are getting known for in the UK. Instead, our stance needs to be as healers, saying, I'm bringing you peace, peace from Jesus. Jesus sent me here to tell you he wants peace with you. He's offering you peace right now. And the peace was the promise from the Old Testament of what would happen when the kingdom came. When God's kingdom came, it would bring peace. It would bring shalom to everyone. So this is a wonderful thing for us to take the stance in Rahampton of we're offering peace to people. That's our stance, not as warriors, but as people offering peace. So then he says, and here's the thing, Haya, and here's the thing, he, he says, you know, if they promote peace, then the peace will rest on them. But if not, it will turn. So over time, you'll find out if this person really wants Jesus's peace. But we'll let that sort itself out a bit later down the road. Okay, verse seven, he says, stay there, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Notice he's, he calls them workers. These 72 or 70 disciples he sent out are called workers. And Jesus is saying, stay in the house of these people and they're gonna give you food and drink. Now again, we've got to be careful how we apply this. Roehampton's a very different world to the ancient Near East. I don't think Jesus is saying to us today, just rock up to some flat in Roehampton, say, peace be with you, I'm moving in for a few weeks, uh, feed me and take care of me. I didn't bring a purse or any money, um, so just take it. I, I think it was a very different culture back then, okay? So I don't think that's what he's saying, but I do think this shows us why Jesus didn't want them taking money or a spare set of sandals, um, which would have worn out quite quickly in those days. What, I think what he's saying is, you guys, I don't want you worrying about money. I don't want you worrying about finances. I don't want you having to go back to fishing again. You know, I want you just to focus on preaching the gospel. So it's a bit different to some of us here. Uh, I don't think... I'm, what I'm not saying to people today is, hey, those of you who've got a full-time job somewhere, quit your job and just preach the gospel in Roehampton. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. I think it's a specific thing for these 70 disciples. But I do think it means if we want to reach the 13,000 people in Roehampton, we need some full-time workers. So a guy who you know, got saved in this church, discipled in this church, and now lives on another estate working for London City Mission, He's a full-time worker and he has other full-time workers around him. They go door knocking every day. They say to people, do you want to start meeting up with me and have a cup of tea and do the urban catechism with me? And they've had a lot of fruit that way. And he said to me the other day, he said, Duncan, you need four full-time workers in a council estate church. And what's often happened over the years is people have thought, if we have a city church, that needs full-time staff, but the council or state churches, they don't need full-time staff. In fact, what's been pushed for many years is, is that pastors of council or state churches should be bivocational, that they should work another job. Like know one pastor, he's a bus driver, and then in his free time, he pastors the church. But increasingly, people doing urban ministry in the UK are saying, no, there's too many needs on council estates that, if anything, we need more full-time staff on council estates. And New Life Church has been its most fruitful when we've had a bunch of people who have been freed up to do full-time ministry on the estate. Sometimes that's because we just had young people in their early 20s who didn't have a job yet, and they just, they lived with their mum on, on the estate and they did evangelism all the time. Other times we've had like apprentices who've been able to do that. We definitely suffer right now from not having full-time workers. But notice as well, he says, do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town unwelcomed, eat what is offered to you. So what, I think what he's saying here is, listen, don't be really choosy. Don't be staying at one house and thinking, oh man, they just give me salads. But there's a house down the road that they eat lamb all the time. I'm going to move to that house. Like the idea, it's not a money thing. It's not like, hey, you guys doing God's work, you should get loads of money. It's not, it's not like the TV evangelists, yeah? It's more like, no, be content with what you have. I put a pi picture of a doctor there because we have doctors in Roehampton, right? 
We've got 13,000 people. How many doctors do we have? Anyone know? Um, I mean, we've got like three surgeries on the estate. And let's say each one has like five doctors, like 15 doctors or something to reach 13,000 people. It's, it's, it's not, maybe it's more doctors than that. I don't know. But why do we have doctors here? Because they're paid to be here. If, the, if, if they didn't get paid, they wouldn't be able to be doctors here, right? And so the same way, if we're really serious about God's work happening in Roehampton, we need to recognize people are gonna to have to be paid. Not a doctor's salary, um, you know, <laughs> they, they don't need to be rolling in it, but people gotta be able to pay their electricity, their food and, and everything, you know, and it's gotta be above minimum wage. Um, okay, so next verse, verse nine, he says, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So we talked about this earlier in Luke's gospel, yeah, that our stance as Christians is that of healers, of healers, not of warriors. I know there's lots of Christian songs that talk about being warriors and all that, but the Bible doesn't talk that much about us being warriors. There's a few references, but mainly it's the stance of being healers. And that's really important at Roehampton because there's so many people hurting in Roehampton. A lot of people don't need a warrior to turn up at their door they need a healer. And thank God that we actually do have an NHS service. There's some times where someone doesn't need you to pray for their healing. Sometimes, well, you could do that, but sometimes people need you to, to go to the doctor's appointment with them or to drive them to the hospital, you know, to help out that way. But there's other times where you might pray for someone to be healed. Um, but notice the link between healing the sick and telling them the kingdom of God has come near. So the point of the healing was to let people know this is what God's kingdom's like. It's a place of healing. And so New Life Church really needs to be a place of healing. And if we do any door knocking in Roehampton, any evangelism in Roehampton, it's really important. It reflects God's kingdom and doesn't reflect all the people that have ripped people off in Roehampton over the years. There have been people in Roehampton in the past who have said, I've got a healing ministry, come and get healed. And, and, and they've ripped people off. It's really important we don't do anything like that. There's people in Roehampton that have given up their, their money that they can hardly pay the bills and they've given their money to people like Benny Hinn or Creflo Dollar, these TV evangelists who are millionaires you know, and, and they shouldn't be asking for money, but they ask for money and people on the estate give them money trying to be healed. So it's really important that anything we do is done in a very different way to, to, to that. And it's really important the way we treat people with disabilities that doesn't hurt them as well. I think it was John Wimber's daughter who a while ago publicly apologized and said, we hurt a lot of people back in the day the way we handled people with disabilities and healing. So we, we've got to make sure whatever we do represents the kingdom of Jesus. And then he says, but when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town, we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. So you might, you might have read this in the Bible and you might have been tempted one time to do this in the street with someone and be like, right, I'm wiping the dust off, off, off my feet. But here's the thing, that doesn't mean anything today, right? If you wipe the dust off your feet today, no one's gonna get what that cultural reference is unless they grew up in church. So we gotta be careful. This meant a certain thing in that day and bear in mind all the towns he's going around, what ethnicity are they, the people in the towns? They're Jewish, they're Jewish, right? So they grew up with the Old Testament. They grew up being taught about God, following God. And then Jesus is saying, you come and tell them the kingdom's here, the Messiah's come. If they reject it, then you wipe the dust off your feet. That's very different to doing that in Roehampton. You share the gospel with one of, one of your neighbors and they don't listen. If you straight away wipe the dust off your feet, that's kind of different to what Jesus is saying here, yeah? Because then he says in verse 12, I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom 
than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. So what Jesus is getting at here is he's saying, you guys, you had the Old Testament, you had all this teaching about God, you were raised by your parents to follow God, then you had miracles from Jesus and his disciples and you still rejected him. That's why the shaking off the dust. It's a big statement. These other towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, he, he's saying they, they didn't get the same miracle. So what we see here is that Jesus does actually judge people according to how much opportunity they've had. And I'll tell you why that's important. 13,000 people in Roehampton, yeah? We talked about this earlier. How many of the 13,000 people in Roehampton have seen evidence that Jesus is real? It's probably not a lot. It's probably not a lot. I mean, none of us in here has met all the 13,000 people in Roehampton, right? Uh, some of you are very sociable, and I know you've, you've met a lot, but none of us have met all 13,000 people. And, and so we really, again, want to have this, this stance uh, as healers of showing people peace, giving people the benefit of the doubt, saying peace to your house. And not quickly saying, oh, you've rejected Jesus. I'm wiping the dust off my feet. And we also got to ask ourselves the question, has Roehampton missed their chance to turn to Jesus? I don't think so. I don't think, if our church does close, I don't think it's because Roehampton's been too hard-hearted. Roehampton spiritually is a tough area, no doubt. Born and raised here, and I've been doing Christian ministry here for over 20 years. It's definitely a hard area compared to everywhere else. I've done Christian work. But there's, I would say there's still, not, there's still not many people, there's a lot of people in Roehampton that haven't seen any evidence of Jesus being alive, which means there's more work for God's church to do. If it's not our church, other churches in the future, there's, there's still more opportunities for Roehampton. I really believe that. And lastly, verse 16, Jesus said, whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me, but whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. So he's telling his disciples, if they reject you, they're really rejecting Jesus. And what that means is we got to make sure if people reject us, they really are rejecting us because of Jesus, but not because we're being jerks. Yeah. So, you know, there was a guy, you might have seen it in the newspapers recently, a guy who had a secret Twitter account. He was saying all this racist stuff on his secret Twitter account. Turns out he's supposedly a Christian at a very well-known church who funds Christian projects. That's really bad. That's really bad. And if anyone ever rejected him sharing the gospel, he might have been like, oh, they're rejecting Jesus. But his racism shows, no. Nah. Like, he, he would be a person to reject in a, in a respectful way and a loving way. But... You know, so we've got to make sure, as Christians, are we representing Jesus or are we representing other stuff? We're not here to represent the Tories. We're not here to represent Labour. You can have your political views, but that's not who we're repping. Yeah, neither of them have got the perfect solution. We're not here to represent the British Empire or the royal family or um, anyone, like he Harry and, 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 and Meghan. Like, you know, you get these different sides you're presented with, right? And you can feel like I've got to represent one of these teams. We're here to represent Jesus. We're here to represent Jesus, the Jesus who was anti-empire and anti-every man-made institution, including the church of his day. You know, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of his day, and he spoke against. So we've got to make sure in Roehampton, we're not representing our favorite cultural warrior. We're representing Jesus. We could still have views about politics. We can have views about the royal family and all these other things. But number one, we're repping Christ. That's what we're about, which means the way we talk to people 
needs to represent Christ as the good shepherd who holds the lambs close to his heart. I'll finish with this. If we keep following Jesus closely, if every day we're listening to Jesus, reading his words, talking to him, worshiping him, we will become more like him. We become more gentle. We become more patient with people. We become better at sharing the love of Christ with people. And that's what Roehampton really badly needs. So let's pray to him now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the good shepherd, that you died on the cross for us. You gave up your life for us. You gave your life up for the people of Roehampton. We thank you for your love. And we pray, Lord God, that you do something in Roehampton so that more people could, could see the evidence that you are real and that you love them, that you made them, that you love every single person on this estate. You don't want them to perish. You want everyone on this estate to live with you forever. Pray, please, God, you give us as a church wisdom to know what should we be doing if we're to carry on doing this ministry, or is it the case that you actually want us to close? Are there other people that are gonna um, do, do the work? Um, give us wisdom, Lord God, and above all, whatever we all find ourselves doing in the coming months, help us to represent you, to be more like you, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, please fill us up. Help us turn away from all the, all the bad things we do that misrepresent you. Help us be more Christ-like. In Jesus' name, amen.